Now, in order to understand what we're talking about, again, we're staying at a very high level of abstraction. We're talking about civilizations. And it's important to understand, a civilization is an all-encompassing framework within which people live their lives. It has a set of principles which distinguishes it from other civilizations. Now, it's just something Americans don't often think about because we're so big as a country and we're so sort of self-satisfied that we don't spend much time looking at other civilizations. I mean, we're, we're a, in many ways, we're an ahistorical society. But if you were, if you were to go and look at the Greeks, if, if I gave you a set of characteristics, you'd say, oh yeah, that's Greek civilization, or that's Mayan civilization, or that's Han China. And some of them could be very simple, as you'll see later on. If I, if I, and, you, and you can start, it's like a detective story. If I said, if I said rice, you would know we had, we, had, we had blocked in a series of possibilities. If I said potato before 1500, can't be Ireland. Potato doesn't come from Ireland. Before 1500, where does potato come from? Yeah. Huh? No. No. It comes from South America. South America. Potato comes from the, Inc from the Incas. And changes the history of Ireland because the potato allows you to grow more protein per acre. Okay? But the potato is, in fact, prior part of 1500, it could not have been European. Okay, so you go through, my point is, if a rice-eating civilization is different than a potato-growing civilization because the entire rhythm of growing rice is different. Rice has to be planted and transplanted. It's a whole different cycle. A wheat-growing civilization has a whole different cycle based on planting and harvesting. Wheat-growing civilizations, which, which is the base of all Western civilization, are, are, are peak system civilizations. That is, you work very, very hard to plant. You then do a little bit of getting rid of the weeds. You then work like crazy to harvest. How does this relate, for example, to peak cycles of studying just before finals? And look at rice, which requires tending to on a much more regular basis. And a rice-growing civilization would have a tendency to teach you to study every day. A wheat-growing civilization would have a tendency to teach you to have a peak experience and relax and a peak experience and relax. Very different rhythms. But, the, but I'm trying to drive at the notion, people begin to acquire rhythms and patterns. Why do, you know, look, look at the difference, and there's a wonderful book by V.O. Key called The Mind of the South that gives you a similar example prior to the, to the age of uh, air conditioning. Look at patterns of life in northern climates where people are literally locked in for the winter by, by uh, bad weather. And you find different rhythms and patterns than you find in a, te in a temperate climate where you can go outdoors all day every day for the whole year. And so take a look at, if I say to you, let's talk about a set of characteristics, and you begin to build the set of characteristics, for example, pyramids can only be two places in the world. Where are they? Egypt, Egypt. Egypt. and Mexico. Mexico. Yeah, and the Mayans. And then you get into what does that mean and why does that mean. So when we talk about civilizations, we're talking about the unifying characteristics within which people normally live their lives. And that different civilizations have a different set of unifying characteristics within which people live their lives. Now, the Toffler argument is that you really have had three what you would call super civilizations. The shift from hunting gathering to agriculture was a super civilization, as you'll see in a minute. Then the shift from uh, agriculture to industry is a super civilization. That is, it affected rice eaters and wheat eaters. Everybody, no matter what your background, you were affected by this sh transition. And so the rise of information is, in the Toffler model, a super civilization. It transcends and absorbs. The wave goes through all of the more normally studied civilizations. Okay? Let's take a minute and look at Toffler's explanation of uh, the three waves of change. For uncounted millions of years, human beings live on an untamed planet. Ten thousand years ago, some genius reached out and altered our lives forever. By planting a seed, that hand launched the first wave of change to surge across the earth. Everywhere, it turned nomads and hunters into peasants and farmers. Three hundred years ago, like a hammer blow in history,
Industrial Revolution spread a new civilization from Europe outward. This was the second great wave of change in human history. Now, a third gigantic wave of change has been unleashed across the planet. Our machines are evolving at a blinding rate. We too are changing. These changes seem random, unconnected, some even familiar. Yet this is only an illusion, for taken together, they form a dramatic pattern. We are creating a new civilization. An old one. Now, in a sense, this is hunter-gatherer. <coughs> this is agriculture. This is industry. And this is the information age. And in a sense, what the Tofflers are arguing is that this is the first wave. Because remember, they're talking about the layer of change. This is the second wave, and this is the third wave. And in fact, you never quite get there. But notice also that because of the way in which the planet works, there are places where agriculture never quite took. Uh, very dry areas, very mountainous areas. Well, guess what you get there? Hunter gathers. So that as late as 40 or 50 years ago, there were still fairly significant stretches of the planet that had uh, hunting gathering societies. There are a handful left today, but mostly as, as deliberately maintained museums. I mean, uh, the, the, the people who survive in the, in the Brazilian rainforest survive because we deliberately will them to survive. Because the sheer reach of, of modern civilization is now so enormous that if we didn't discipline ourselves, we'd, we'd overrun the Bushmen, the Kalahari. I mean, these are people who, are, who will rapidly be absorbed into this. And you have to raise an ethical question at some point. Is it really fair to a human being who happens to have been born randomly into this environment to not let them have a laptop, not give them a vaccination against polio, and not dramatically raise their lives? And yet the second you do, you blow, you blow apart this system. Like uh, hmm? That's like the Maasai. Yeah, no, 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 the Maasai would be here. This would be the Bush from the Kalahari. In fact, in fact I have a list here. <coughs> let, let me just say, I'm putting this up because what I want to emphasize and go through for a minute is that in each wave, everyone experiences the same general change, although the details are different in each society. That is, during a period when your hunter-gatherers tend to be similar everywhere on the planet. And then as this wave of agriculture occurs, they tend to all go through the same thing even though they express it in the ways that are unique to their region. Agricultural civilizations are, in a way, very similar to each other. And I'll come back to that. When they start to change into industry, they all go through the same wave-like pattern, although they express it differently in each civilization. Then, when industries arise, it, you know, for example, male, you know, males wear suits. It's almost totally universal in industrial society everywhere on the planet. And it's an artifact. No, no particular reason it to be true. As, as this begins to break down, guess what happens? Guess what's the most commonly sold article of clothing as you make the transition into an information age? Blue jeans. Blue jeans. Everywhere. And you see the breakdown of, of, of dress codes. Everywhere. Okay? okay. Microsoft. Microsoft. 